Gay Media Network. Make sure to like and subscribe so you can get more content such as this from other hosts representing their different alma maters. And also don't forget the Locker Room app where we do pre and post game uh, shows uh, discussing obviously games coming up and our reactions to games that just happened. Again, those same hosts uh, who are going through the Field of 68 Media Network is also going through the Locker Room app. So make sure to like and subscribe and to download that app. Today, we have an extremely special guest, our 14th guest on the podcast, our first female guest as well. Very much excited to have her on board. She is, oh, let me get my uh, stuff straight here because we don't want to make, we want to make sure we give her all of her flowers while she's with us today. She has scored 1,552 points, 657 rebounds, 302 assists, and 253 made threes in her career at the Hilltop. She's 11th in Jay's history in points scored. She's the first ever Jay to be drafted in the WNBA draft. That's the final pick of the second round in the 2020 WNBA draft. She set a Creighton record of 43 points in her final game at DJ Sokol Arena. She, saw, she shot 100%. From the free throw line in Big East competition her senior year, she was a Big East Player of the Year in 2020, Big East First Team in 2020 as well, Big East All-Tournament Team in 2019, Big East Second Team in 2018, Big East Freshman of the Year in 2017. She's the proud of Andover, Kansas. Jalen Agnew is on the podcast. Welcome to the J, Jalen. Thank you. Wow, that was quite the intro. <laughs> it had to be. We have to give you, you know, like I said, we have to hand you your flowers while you're here because it's rare that we have, you know, such amazing athletes on this podcast. <laughs> no disrespect to the previous guests and to the ones who are coming afterwards, but I'm just so excited to have you on the podcast today and, you know, talk to you about your career and all that stuff. How have you been? How have you been holding up? Pretty good, you know, just the rehabbing. I'm sure we'll get into that, but just been rehabbing and trying to stay healthy. This is kind of funny because, you know, I did uh, the development podcast with you a couple days ago. So it feels like I literally just talked to you recently. Um, that was a little bit more about me and my career tonight. We're going to get into you and your career. So let's have some fun with it. Obviously, it all starts in high school for you at Andover High School up in Kansas. You Man, you've been a bucket from the very start. You were a four-year starter, a three-time conference MVP, three-time first-team all-selection. Uh, so, yeah, like I said, you've basically been a bucket from the very get-go. Kind of talk to me about, obviously, you know, your high school career, some of the stuff that you took away from that. But when did you start realizing, like, yo, like, this is my thing. I'm a hooper. This is what I do. And I should really start focusing on that. Um, it's funny you say that, actually, because I played – three sports all throughout high school um I, so I know all, you're you're spoiling yeah. a lot of stuff we're <laughs> gonna get into it. all that so um I actually had offers for both um basketball and track and so I kind of had a debate you know what I wanted to do but I had been playing basketball since I was five um it was just like my first love and so um I had options you know at some schools um to do both track and basketball but I just stuck with basketball um, for multiple reasons. But I think just the team atmosphere um, and then track. I don't know. If, I don't know about anyone else, but track, like since you're by yourself, I'm like much more mental with that. And so I thought that was going to be a little challenging for me. Um, so I definitely just stuck with basketball. <laughs> It's, I mean, also volleyball was in there too. Your junior year, you won MVP. <laughs> so you just had a multitude of options, obviously, as far as recruiting is concerned. And that's what I want to get into as well. Obviously, it shows CU, but like you mentioned, you had offers for track. You mentioned you had different offers, obviously, for basketball as well. Talk to me about like your recruiting process going through, was it two sports? Was it three sports? Were you getting some love for volleyball as well? So yeah, I was getting some love for volleyball as well. Um, not as much though. Um, cause I didn't play, um, like club volleyball. So I just did just club basketball. Um, mm -hmm. but track was, was actually really funny because I had in middle school, I started track. I mean, in middle school, everyone starts track because you're with, you're out there with your friends, like it's super fun, whatever. And I was actually like pretty decent at high jump. And so, um, I was like, okay, like, I think I'm just going to stick with this. You know, it's like my main one. I also did some sprints here or there, but high jump was like my main thing. So four I time champ, four time champ. Let me give you all your flowers today. <laughs> yep, four time state champ. So um, I definitely had some looks for that. Um, but yeah, like like I said, I had a couple um, options to do both 
um, basketball and track. Um, but I think most of the schools knew that I was mainly focused on basketball. And so that's what I was more like geared towards anyway. And so, yeah, Creighton was actually, they're kind of late. It's kind of funny. They're kind of late in my recruiting process. Um, and coach Chev, who's my, who's been my, was my position coach. I now like work with her and like for her kind of. Um, so um, she, she kind of reached out on Twitter actually and was like, Hey, love to get to talk to you, blah, blah, blah. And then from there, she went on some visits. I, I think I went on four visits. Um, so it was like, I'm trying to think of who all was. It was Wyoming, Drake, Creighton, and it was a bad that I don't know the fourth one. Oh, Tulsa, there you go. <laughs> oh my God. Obviously, you, you chose the right decision, so I mean, it's fine. Exactly. But- yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so, and then I just, it felt like home, you know, the coaching staff was super personable. Um, Flan had a good track record um, with successful teams. Um, at that point, there had been no transfers in, I'm not sure how many years, but now it's like 12 years, I think. So, um, so I think just all of that spoke to um, what I wanted to be a part of. And so ended up at CU. We're definitely going to talk more about Coach Flan as, you know, we we have this conversation as the night goes on. I think some of the stuff that he's done has been so underrated and obviously deserves some recognition too. So you already mentioned about, you know, people not wanting to leave once they get into the program. That's really something that we're going to get into uh, a little bit later on. So you arrive on campus, uh, I'm sure, you know, through uh, your development at that point and also talking to the coaching staff about, you know, their vision of where they think that you could have ended up at you guys decide mutually obviously to redshirt what went through that decision that year like i've spoken to a bunch of our you know welcome to the j alumni the the guests who have come before you some of those guys who have redshirt i've always talked about how difficult it is to kind of swallow that pride because you want to contribute right away so what went into that decision for you and how did you deal with that decision that you and the staff made mutually yeah so exactly that you know you you come in so Obviously, you're a set at your high school and you come in, you want to contribute and you want to play. And then, you know, you have some scrimmages, you work out. And like, for me, at least, because I came in because I was trying to, you know, be smaller, trying to get over the high jump bar, because that was the, my, my sport right before we came in. And right. so I'm running into screens and like MC McGrory and Brianna Rollerson, I'm running into their screens and I'm like, geez like I can't get over these yeah. I'm like and MC is not even that like tall but she's just like strong mm-hmm. and so I was like oh my goodness like I'm gonna have to do something here and so we decided to redshirt and I needed to gain like a like ton more weight I was scrawny like I said trying to get over the high jump bar um and just skill wise I think we, we actually also had 15 people on that team freshman year so um more than likely I was probably not going to play um Mm -hmm. for the most part you know so I thought it was going to be a good opportunity to redshirt and I tell everyone now like I think it was the best decision I've ever made like in terms of college because like it just prepared me so much for the next four years and even now um and just you know really putting in that work like knowing what hard work is you know you're practicing every day with the team you're doing your extra workouts shooting Mm -hmm. workouts and you're lifting four times a week where the team might only be lifting like two times a week in season so all that type of stuff um I think was just it's super beneficial and like anyone if they I always tell like especially on the girls side if you have an option to redshirt do it because I also was able to get a master's degree out of the whole thing so I was going to ask you, but you just kind of touched on it right now. I was going to ask you, aside from obviously gaining the weight that you needed to just to be, you know, an active athlete, a good athlete on the court, what are some of the other lessons that you learned uh, specifically on the court that uh, redshirt year that helped you throughout your career? I think just patience, you know, not everything's going to come overnight. Um, And that was the whole thing with that redshirt year, you know, I might not see the results right then, but, you know, within the next coming seasons, um, hopefully some things will start to come to fruition and that, you know, that happened with my um, freshman of the year and then so forth and so on with the rest of my career. Um, And like I said, the masters um, that I was able to get, like that was super fortunate, you know, be able to have all that paid for um, while still playing basketball. Um, And so, yeah, I think, I mean, those probably the best, best things you can, you can get from that. So. 
It's that time of year again, folks. Conference tournaments are tipping off. Bubble teams are making their final push for a bid, while the best teams in the country are gearing up for a deep run. Automatic bids will be punched, slippers will be fit, and our partners at DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook, are putting my listeners at the center of the action. If you bet $4 on an underdog in a select game this week and that underdog wins, you win $256. That's right, $256. Here's how it all works. Download the app now and use the promo code FIELD68 when you sign up. Scroll through the list of select underdogs, bet $4 on them to win, and cash $256 when they do. There's no better way to put your college hoops knowledge to use than to put your money where your mouth is with DraftKings Sportsbook. It's safe, it's secure, it's reliable, and you can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. So remember, that's code FIELD68, all caps, FIELD68 to turn $4 into $256. For a limited time only, must be 21 years of older, restrictions do apply. Go to DraftKings.com for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. You had an immediate impact uh, your freshman year. Obviously, I mentioned it. You just mentioned it again, winning uh, Big East Freshman of the Year for an NCAA tournament team. So it wasn't like you were you know, in a bad situation and you got all the shine, like you really were in an important part of that team. Talk about stepping into that freshman season. Obviously, I'm sure you had a bunch of jitters. You didn't play a full whole year. Like you've been waiting to get on the court. Talk about that freshman year, that team specifically, and, you know, what made things like click as well as it did. That team was so fun because, um, I mean, so my class, we had – they had no one originally coming in the class after us. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I registered my freshman year. And then two of the girls that were also in my class had registered that year. So we all ended up being in the same class. Um, mm-hmm. So we had been with that team for like two whole years at that point. Um, and so everyone was just like all in, you know, we had played with each other for two years now with no other additions. So we could hit the ground running, you know, in the summer where usually you have freshmen, you're trying to get acclimated, but we could just, you know, get start from the get go. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, so I actually, it's kind of funny. Um, I mean, it's not funny, but kind of is. So I didn't play a ton, like our first couple games. Um, I was just, you know, coming in every once in a while, but like you said, I was nervous, whatever. Um, and then actually... MC McGrory, she ended up having a concussion and it was her, I don't even know how many concussions. So she was actually not able to play anymore. If anybody knows MC, she was the type of girl, she'd run through a brick wall for her teammate. Like, I don't know how many concussions that girl had. That was probably like her fifth or sixth at some point. Like that made her have to sit out for a little while. And you're saying that kind of gave you an avenue to step on the court more frequently, correct? Exactly. Yes. So she actually, yeah, had to stop playing. I think it was like her sixth actually. And so I think the first game where I really was like, um, wow, like I'm, I'm playing a lot more was actually almost, I think might've been the game she got hurt. It was the KU game at home and mm-hmm. I was like thrown in there and I played a lot more and I was, you know, getting more deflections. I hadn't, I didn't really, I don't think score that much that game, but I was getting deflections. Um, you know, I was just all over defensively. They had a pretty good player, Jessica Washington, I think. And um, it was like my job to, to defend her. And I was like, oh, here we go. Like, this is this is the time. So yeah. um, I actually think I did pretty well on her. So it kind of gave me a little confidence there. Um, and then just tried to, you know, ride that confidence throughout the rest of the season. So you have a great uh, freshman year going into that sophomore year where I think you really kind of put your stamp on the program uh, or began to put your stamp on the program. You obviously got more uh, trust from the coaching staff. You're all of a sudden coming from, you know, not only just being like this player that provides energy off the bench, but like sets are being ran for you and you're a trigger point in the offense. Talk about going into that sophomore year off season though. What are some of the things that you and the coaching staff were talking about? Like, hey, look, like you had a really good freshman year, but we need you to do this, this, and that if we want to obviously not only help yourself, but help this team get to the next level. Yeah, my main thing, I mean, that year and the next two years was just being more aggressive on the um, offensive end. You know, mm-hmm. I was, they knew I was going to be fine defensively. I mean, for the most part, um, but um, I still had a ton of room to grow offensively. Um, and so just, you know, being more aggressive with my shot and with the dribble, um, you know, I would early in my career, I'd pass up some shots now that 
if I were to watch film, I'd be like, why did I not shoot that? You know? Right. <laughs> and so um, I think that was probably the biggest thing um, because, you know, especially what they said, like, um, you know, if me not taking that shot early in offense or whatever could result into a bad shot later or fourth shot, stuff like that. So that was pretty much um, the main thing. I mean, like I said, that year and the next couple of years, there's a point, I don't know if it was that year or the next year where they were like, you literally have to shoot or we're going to lose every game. <laughs> they were like, every time you get the ball, you need to look to shoot because right. like, we need your offense. And so there'd be times where on the sideline, like in practice, they were like, shoot Jalen, blah, blah, blah. And they're yelling at me. And then I'd come off and they'd be like, so why didn't you shoot that? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and so they would like get mad at me for not shooting. And usually, you know, when you think of like basketball, people like coaches get mad if you shoot too much. So I like, didn't want to like, be that person to shoot too much, but they're like, no, you Respect need to be boundaries in play. Yeah. 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 I feel you. Yeah. Uh, it's also like the shift, I would say like from your freshman year to your sophomore year, where you become a lot more of a leader where you used to be kind of a sponge, like absorbing as much information as you possibly can. All of a sudden now you've been with the team for that was your third year, technically because of your redshirt year. And uh, you know, the girls around you are looking at you in more of a leadership position. I know you, I know you're a super humble girl. So like how weird was it that like people were kind of looking up to you already at that point and it was just your second year, you know, playing division one basketball. Yeah, um, it was definitely a challenge. Um, I mean, we had a great um, senior class that year. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you obviously like, they, they're like the like primary leaders, I guess you can say just because of their age, they've been there, you know. Um, but then, um, you know, I was playing a lot, especially as some young person, I guess, a younger person in the, um, in the team. And so you kind of have to, you know, balance that leadership. I was and at that point, I was more of like a lead by example, not as much as a vocal leader. Uh, mm -hmm. I think our seniors were um, more so vocally, um, vocal leaders there. So I was just kind of, you know, in the background kind of leading by example. But then, you know, as you grow older, you kind of have to find your voice there. So um, I think I also did that once I got older, so. Another NCAA tournament run that year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you have an incredible game against Iowa in the first round. Uh, talk about, you know, making an NCAA tournament, um, obviously having a big game while you're on that big stage and helping your team advance to the next round. Yes, so that, um, that was a super fun game because um, we actually scrimmage Iowa every year. And mm -hmm. so at the beginning of the year, we always travel Iowa City, scrimmage them. And so when we had the selection show, first of all, that selection show was insane. <laughs> we were so scared and nervous. Um, and then their name pops up. We were yeah. like, heck yeah, like we got this in the bag, you know, <laughs> like we had scrimmaged them. I think they had actually beat us that year, but we mm -hmm. were like, we know the in scrimmage or in the regular season, I don't remember. Um, scrimmage. Okay. Yeah. And so we had scrimmaged them that year and we were like, we know the ins and outs of their team, you know, their personnel, like we got this. And so we came out, like we weren't going to lose. There's no way we're going to lose that first game at all. And so, um, yeah, we just go out We're in, we're at UCLA, they were hosting. And so we just go out and like that game was so, fun. everyone was so hyped. Like I remember, so for example, Sydney Lamberty, if anyone knows Sid, like she's so like even keeled throughout the entire game, like has no emotion and she has an and one. And she has this like, yeah, like celebration. And I was like, what in the heck is going on? Like, we are in this thing for sure. Like, because like Sid would never have any like emotion. And when that happened, I was like, oh yeah, there's no way we're losing this game. <laughs> the NCAA tournament is such a crazy feeling. Like it, it really reveals like everyone's character. Like even the most, like you said, Sid probably the most even keel girl all of a sudden like emotions are high, they're flowing through her. She gets a big time and one, she lets everybody in the gym hear about it. Uh, aside from obviously like uh, that experience, obviously traveling out to LA, uh, you beat Iowa. I think you guys lose to UCLA the next round. Just talk about like overall that experience, some of the stuff that you learned from it uh, that helped carry you through to the rest of your career. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that senior class was, um, we were so close with them and so, also my, in my mind, I was like, you know, I don't want to be done like playing with them because I had played with them for however long, um, mm -hmm. I guess three years at that point, I guess two years on the, on the court, but three years with my red shirt year. Um, and so 
Um, that was kind of what was flowing through my mind. But I think the biggest thing I learned um, from that sophomore year, um, you know, was probably just, again, being more aggressive um, offensively and having a voice leadership wise. Um, and I knew, so that class actually had like five seniors, I think. So I knew that next year we were going to have to, um, you know, fill those spots offensively, defensively, and in a leadership role um, because, you know, of all of their absences. So um, it was definitely an adjustment, but um, it was, it was fun to play with them all. And that was like, that was one of the, I think most fun memories it was probably that, that Iowa game was super fun. <laughs> Your junior year was an extremely tough one for you individually and uh, dealing with a bunch of injuries and stuff as the year is going on. And it obviously uh, hindered your team's success uh, for a team, you know, that I believe in the preseason had, had some pretty good hopes about what they, where they thought they could end up. Um, it, it didn't, you know, turn out that way. Obviously your injuries were kind of a big part of that. Talk about some of the frustrations of, you know, all that buildup. You just go to two straight NCAA tournaments as a freshman, as a sophomore, you expect your junior year to be much of the same. Um, but unfortunately, you know, injuries derail your plan. Talk about kind of like the frustrations of that year and what motivated you to just, you know, kind of keep going, kind of keep grinding to reach back to, you know, where you guys thought you should be in the first place. Yeah, like you said, that was a super difficult year. Um, you know, like I learned so much from that year. Um, so the timeline of every, everything, I guess we were in preseason and I like strained, sprained my ACL um, in the knees that I tore now. Um, and then I got back, I was back for three or four games, I think. And then I tore a ligament in my thumb. Um, and so, and on my shooting hand, dominant hand, all that fun stuff. Um, so I was out for about five or six games, I think. So yeah, just coming back, you know, first of all, the knee, the knee, I wasn't really too worried about. Um, I don't know why I just wasn't, I, I was like, you know, I'll be fine, like whatever. But then the hand thing, like, that one just like mentally I was like that's my dominant hand it's my shooting hand like my shot's gonna be weird after this you know all that goes through your mind and so I ended up having to play with this like huge like clunky brace that like protected my thumb and that was just like so hard like just like getting back into it and you know like sure my shot wasn't how I thought it was gonna be you know it wasn't the same um I had this thing like weighing me down my follow-through you know all these like different factors and so you know first coming back that was so so tough and I know Chef, Chef could speak on this for days but I was so frustrated because I wasn't <laughs> you know where I was at before um yeah. but she's like well, of course you're not going to be you just got hurt and I was like I know but I want to be you know like that competitive per like person that fire in you um and so you know I was doing all right you know I came back had a couple decent games um and then the conference tournament so throughout the season you know I had ups and downs and then the conference tournament hits and that's kind of where I was just like you know like I didn't have that bracelet anymore I just had tape and I was like here we go like we got to do something and um, that's rock and roll baby <laughs> yes, exactly. and so those those last those games I think I really really propelled me into that senior year Let's talk about it because you had an incredible senior year. You left CU with an absolute bang, uh, average 20 plus points a game. Uh, I already mentioned in the intro your crazy last game on senior night. After the injury riddled junior year, did you feel some sort of like vindication? Like, yes, like this is the player that I always thought I could be, that I should be. Uh, during that senior year run um, and obviously you end up winning Big East player of the year and then uh, we'll get into it a little bit later but I, everything gets cut down show because of COVID so kind of talk to me about like that senior year and and how that entire ride made you feel obviously emotionally because it's your last ride but also because of you know everybody finally got to see the complete full package of what you inherently already knew that you were. Yeah so um, it's funny you said like that I knew that I was because I did not know I was capable of that like I literally you know you always oh. like, you hope, no you hope you know like like oh like I want to like I want to come back like I want the senior year to be good the last year wasn't that great um, and like looking back like my freshman year there's no way I would have been like I'm I'm gonna get biggies or I'm gonna get biggies part of the year my senior year like there's no way I would have thought that um, so, so, like, so even after freshman of the year, you didn't think, oh, like if things keep going the way that they are, the trajectory keep going up, I might have a chance at this. You never once thought that. No, like I, I was shocked when I got 
when I got freshman of the year, like I was, I was in class with Sid and mm -hmm. I like, my phone is blowing up like in my backpack and I like look down and it's like, I read a message and I'm like, what? I look at Sid, I'm like, I just got freshman of the year. <laughs> like, I was like, what? Like, how did that happen? And so, um, yeah, but that senior year, everything just like came together, you know, um, my, you know, my teammates that year, like everyone was like, so like, just like willing to like help me in, in everything, you know, like I live, especially Olivia Elger, she um, was my other classmate. And mm -hmm. like, she, she is like the toughest player like I've ever played with. Like, she's like MC, like she'll put her body on the line for anything she had multiple knee surgeries like came back and still wanted to play poor girl she only could she like practice like once a week to be able to play in games um and so she just helped me like from a leadership aspect um the whole team just like had my back and um yeah everything just like came to fruition and I while it was going on I just was like I don't know I didn't really think of think of anything but you know looking back I was like wow, like I was balling out there, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, geez, I guess, you know, I was putting like averaging 20 points. Like, and like I said, I never thought I, and so it was just like really eye opening to me to be like, wow, like, like all this hard work is like now, like coming, like I said, coming to fruition. So like by, by all means, it really looked like that team was headed to another NCAA tournament berth. In my opinion, I thought that's where you guys were heading. I'm sure you're shaking your head right now uh, in agreeing with me. Talk about hearing the news that none of that was going to happen. Um, I, I talked to, uh, you know, Marcus Zagorowski, Damian Jefferson this year on the podcast, and they talked about last year and their feelings of like, like we had all just done this amazing thing. We really want this thing to keep going. And then obviously everything got cut short because of COVID. So talk to me about like, first of all, when you first found out that news and then how it made you feel. And then like, what was going through your mind during that entire process? Yeah, I mean, that was, that sucked. Like it, I was back home because like we're, so we lose in Big East tournament and I'm back home, like at my high school gym, like getting up shots because um, just, just preparing for, like I said, NCAA tournament practices coming up. And so I have my Apple Watch on. Apple Watch starts like buzzing and I go check my phone and I see like the NCAA tournament is canceled. And I'm like, I sat there for like 30 minutes. Yeah. I was like, what? Like, it can't just end like that. You know what I mean? And so I, I just like stopped shooting. I was like, I, I don't know, I even know what to do right now. So I drove home and I like see my parents and I just like start crying like immediately um just because I you know it's like so after like I said the like super good year and like we don't we don't get to experience that especially for the young kids like I wanted them to experience that so bad to like help propel them you know for the years to come um and so it was just super hard um and then to like at that point it's like what happens next you know what I mean like mm -hmm. I my junior year I think is when I realized like I wanted to keep playing basketball um, whether that was WNBA or just overseas, I didn't know at that point. Um, so then, yeah. So once that happened, I was like, well, like what, you know, like I said, what happens <laughs> next? Like, what, where do I go from here? So <laughs> it was a, um, definite, definite, you know, like shock and, um, hard, hard, you know, I would say a couple weeks there for sure. I'm sure it was tough for you to like, not only feel it on your wrist as you're shooting, but to go over to your phone and that's how you find out you know, that your career as a collegiate athlete is over. I can only imagine, like, my heart goes out to you in that moment. Like, that absolutely sucks. It sounded like it was, like, just such a, I guess, horrible way to find out and also not the best way to cap off uh, your year. But, I mean, Korean fans will always remember you for being, you know, one of the best uh, women's basketball players that the program has seen. You certainly cemented your legacy on that program. We touched on uh, Coach Flan a little bit earlier, and I definitely want to go back to him and, you know, some of the stuff that he's done for the program and, and obviously in his, I think, 12 years or so that he's been there. Um, talk to me about, like, obviously your relationship with him, your relationship with the coaching staff, the stuff that he did. Uh, to help you in your development, uh, not only obviously as an athlete, but also as a person. Yeah, I mean, I talk to Flan like still all the time. Like we all, when we end the phone calls, like love you, just like like a family, yeah. <laughs> you know, like that type of stuff. Um, Flan, yeah, is like one of the best coaches I've ever had. Um, he's you know so like personable, um, and he does a good job of, um, especially with his his coaching staff, like getting like 
you know, like-minded, but also people that can challenge him um, Mm -hmm. for like a different point of view, you know, especially, you know, not just on basketball in, but just like, you know, in general. Um, And so, yeah, he just, he helped me in so many, so many different regards. Um, You know, we had our off season, preseason meetings, all those type of meetings, you know, you know, he's going to be honest with you, what he expects from you. Um, Mm -hmm. but he's also just a super fun person to be around and can like separate basketball from life too. And so I think that's what makes him special. Um, but, and then like our assistant coaches too, like, um, everyone, like our assistant coaches, they're like hilarious because they're young enough to like still know what's going on. So they like help plan (laughs) in that (laughs) regard, especially with like social media and stuff, but they're like, so awesome. Like I definitely consider them like, my friends now for sure. Um, that's like weird to say. Cause like, I still, I still on my phones. They're like coach Chevy, coach Linda, you know? Right. Um, but, um, yeah, he, they do a good job to all together, just like working and like I said, developing you as a player and a person. And like, I owe all my development to Chev for sure. Chev was my position coach mm-hmm. and she, had me my freshman year I swear this is so embarrassing but I'm gonna say it anyway my freshman year when I was redshirting like you're just like kind of out there and like you're on the gray squad you know so you're not like with the team so he's not like yelling at you so you're kind of just like am I doing everything okay so after practice like my freshman year I'd probably like cry like at least three times a week I'm not kidding and Chev would be the first person there being like why are you crying like you're doing fine I'm like right. I don't know. you know what I mean and so I mean she's helped me so much like with the mental aspect of the game, like skill wise and everything. So it has just been a good learning experience with all the coaches. What is it <laughs> about the culture that, you know, Flan uh, cultivated that has made it so that, like you mentioned earlier, like no one has transferred out of the program. Like every girl who commits to Crane does their four or five years and they're happy about it. They always say it's the best experience, the best choice that they've ever made. No one leaves you know, that, that culture that he's created. So what do you think it is about just the program in general that just is so welcoming for, you know, young women like you who, you know, find a home to obviously develop not only as student athlete, but as people as well? I think just how personable they are and like how close knit everyone is. Like, for example, we've had teammates, you know, babysit for Flam. We've had teammates babysit for our director of, op- of ops, Jenny. Like, we just are all so tight knit and playing, like I said, does a good job of just preparing you for not just basketball, but life afterwards. Um, and so I think that's really where, um, where people, you know, they kind of look back and be like, wow, like they helped me so much. Um, and I know they've helped me tremendously. And I'm sure later on in life, I'll be hearing some flanisms in the back of my mind, you know? Um, but yeah, I think it's just that whole, that whole thing and just like I said how just loving and caring they are for you not just as a basketball player but as a person you know they're always asking like how's the, how's your family like how's your grandma like stuff like that you know not not every coach um does does that type of thing and so um I think that's just really where it sets them apart so let's talk about obviously you hear that your college your college career is over you are not quite sure what's going to happen next, but you know that you want to continue with basketball. What was that grind like up until, you know, draft night, knowing that your name is going to be in the pool of players who are going to be selected, hopefully? Uh, not quite sure what the future holds, but talk about just like the grind of staying in shape during a COVID off season, uh, not knowing what the future holds, but also having these uh, expectations to keep moving forward with basketball. Yeah, so, I mean, so at that point, you know, once like, so I think it was like Rudy Gobert once he did all his stuff and then NBA shuts down. That's when like NCAA shut down. And so then everything shuts down. So you're like, I'm at home trying to find a gym, like, you know, like the why even I'm like, I don't even know what's, what's, what I can use. Thankfully, like we had some stuff here, but I had, I don't even have like a hoop at my house. So I was like driving down to this outdoor hoop, like in this other neighborhood, just to be able to get shots up. Like literally I had like, it was just a crazy, crazy ordeal. And then yeah. the couple of days after the, um, you know, the tournament was canceled, I get some like um, emails and stuff from some agents. And I was like, I don't even want to think about this right now. Like I'm still like mourning the loss of, you know, my like freaking career, you know? Um, <laughs> So then 
I end up talking with some agents and I kind of like feel them out, see what they're we're thinking. And I end up getting an agent. And so he, um, you know, I was talking with WNBA teams and I end up actually, so before the draft, I had some um, pre-draft like um, interviews and stuff. And so um, those are super intimidating. You know, I'm down here, like, you know, like sitting here, like they're asking me questions and I'm nervous, like sweating. Um, Cause I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I don't even know, like, like, I'm like, are they, am I on their radar? Like, are they just like trying to get a feel for who I am, you know? Uh Um, And so I had a bunch of those, talked with a bunch of the coach. I think I talked to almost every coach except for three or four of them Mm -hmm. um, in some capacity, whether it's like a, an interview like, like this or um, over the phone. And so, you know, you go on draft night and I'm just like, I don't even know if I'm going to get called. Like, I'm hoping like my agents, like, you know, we're thinking, um, mid second round to third round blah 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 and I'm like all right like let's hope you know like I'm just that's all I just kept saying I was like let's hope and people people talking to me like weeks like leading into it they're like ready for the draft like ready to get drafted and I'm like let's hope you know <laughs> and so um just yeah leading up to it was just insane it was just crazy so you're the, you were the last pick of the second round Talk to me about like hearing name after name after name after name. And all of a sudden you hear your name being called. Talk about like, first of all, that feeling. And then like, what was the first thing that you did right after that you heard your name being called? So um, I, well, first off, like I was trying to have a normal day that day because I'm like, I can't psych myself out, you know? So like I get up, I work out, like I'm chilling and then it hits probably I think the draft was at like five or six and it hits probably like two or three mm-hmm. and like I can't eat I can't like drink anything like I'm getting nervous I'm like I don't know what to do here and like I still have so much time leading up to it and right. so yeah like we're watching like obviously you see like Sabrina go first and you see like all the big names and then mm-hmm. second round hits and I'm like okay like gotta keep an eye out you know name goes by names goes by and um someone had someone was texting me just about like who had gotten chosen and I was looking at my phone and like I look up right as like that right as the like 24th pick is about to be called and then my yeah. name flashes and my mom is sitting like right next to me and she like has this loud scream and yeah. <laughs> like what the heck and so then I like hug them you know and then yeah. my mom's like hold on hold on hold on and she's like trying to get a computer and I'm like like why are you getting a computer and she was like well, I'm supposed to do this, but like, I don't know how to do it. And so my Creighton team is supposed to surprise me on Zoom saying, oh, okay. my mom messed it up. <laughs> and I was like, good job, mom. Like, like you just ruined the whole thing though. But it was so nice of them to be able to, um, you know, enjoy it with them. Cause you know, we would have been at school normally. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, it was super, I was super thankful to be able to enjoy it with them and the coaching staff, um, even if it was through Zoom. And then that night, you know, I just had, interviews with um like the washington um you know like journalists and media um obviously talked to, with the coaches there um you know everyone sending congrats and stuff so i was up to like 3 a.m that night just because i like my heart rate could not come down <laughs> it was crazy so you obviously got introduced to the business of basketball super early on before you even get a chance to put a mystics jersey on you get traded to atlanta Talk to me about being like, wait, hold on. Like, I thought we had a good thing going here. <laughs> to like, okay, I guess I'm a dream from here on out. <laughs> yeah, so it was definitely a weird process because, you know, at that point, you know, with the draft, they didn't know what, if they were going to have a season or what was going to happen with season. And so, um, you know, we actually had like Zoom workouts. So I had ended up actually moving to Omaha. Um, I lived with Carly. <laughs> Chris Berger. Shout out Carly. Yeah. And so then I was working out with Chev because like at that point I was like, who knows if they're just going to start up season right away, like what we're going to do. So um, I ended up staying up there working out with Chev just, just in case, you know, stuff was going to start soon. And then um, there's like talks about how um, for people to get paid, you know, the rosters are going to have to be cut down without having a training camp. So in my mind, I think, you know, like as a coach, like you are going to go with what, you know, like unless you're the top pick, whatever, you know, like, you know, a lot of people are probably going to get cut, especially rookies. And so um, I ended up getting a call from coach Tebow, you know, saying I've, I've been waived, you know, but he says, you know, he's hoping that once they figure out with training camp situation and stuff, um, if we're going to have a season that I'd be like his first, you know, choice to come back and try out for a spot. 
And so you know, I'm kind of just like in limbo here. I'm like, you know, I guess I'm just going to keep working out because I could get a call from them. I could get a call from another team. So I'm just going to, you know, keep, keep working, keep, you know, grinding here. So I was up, I was back or still in Omaha, you know, just working out for, I mean, I guess I'm almost a month at that point, kind of. Um, and then they figure out that they're going to have the bubble season, you know, down in Florida. And I get a call um, from coach Nikki Collin and she's, um, she didn't, you know, right away say like once you're on the team, but she's like kind of filling me out and seeing like, if, um, if I was down there, you know, if I'd like work hard, like, do I want to be down there? And I'm like, heck yeah. Like I do anything to be able to like be down there. Um, and so she's kind of had to decide like with, um, her roster and if more people are going to opt out. And so someone else ended up opting out. And then she called me, I think the next day or the day after, um, and said that they wanted me to be a part of the dream. And then literally in three days, I drove back home and packed for three months in Florida. <laughs> talk about the WNBA bubble um you know that atmosphere to just be you know in that environment where there's so many restrictions due to COVID at that point in time literally we I mean we still kind of are ignorant to what you know COVID is but especially in that time we're like what is going on how do you contract with all that stuff so just talk to talk to me about like what went what was going through your mind at that time uh obviously understanding that they're trying to have this happen because obviously they want the product out there they want to pay their players but at the same time they're trying to make sure that the environment is safe for you guys to perform you know your which is what your job is right now so talk to me about that kind of bubble experience and you know some of the COVID restrictions that were placed on you while you were in that environment yeah so we were on um IMG's campus so it literally felt like I was back at college again just in a different place much warmer more humid um did some workouts out there and it was the first week I was like geez I, I'm like yes. I'm not breathing all heavy and it's all damp everywhere um mm -hmm. but yeah the a lot of people were skeptical going in you know like how many times you're gonna get tested like is it really closed off to just the WBA and so we actually ended up um we had our own kind of um part of campus and they actually ended up having um like tennis camps and like football camps on like the other part of campus um so we were like that but we had testing um every day you know some people they told us originally that we were going to have it every day for the first two weeks and then it was going to taper off but we ended up having it every day um mm -hmm. so it really made it seem safe like I was telling everyone like it was probably like the safest place to be in the world at that point because we were getting tested every day and like we knew what we were like getting ourselves into um, and, you know, they had a um, restriction for if you tested positive, you know, leaving your room, being transferred to a hotel that was like solely for people that tested positive. Um, you know, you were there, they brought you your food, all that type of stuff. And so um, I think they had a really good protocol going. Um, you know, we had to wear masks everywhere also. Um, so it did really, it felt really safe. Um, and I was just happy to be down there and playing with, you know, whole, whole new system, new girls and everything. Your team took it upon themselves to kind of speak up on some of the injustices that was happening across the country at the time. Like this summer was so big for social justice reform and, you know, conversations being had about the right things and the wrong things that's going on in society. Uh, talk to me about, obviously, in your team specific dynamic of your owner being a, you know, uh, she was going for re-election and some of the legislation that she had obviously went against what a lot of you guys um, as, you know, people of color or, you know, just allies um, thought about the way the world that should be. So talk to me about like some of the stances that took place in the bubble, um, you know, the way the players, you know, manifested their rights to protest and also spoke up for some of the injustices that were happening around the country. Yeah, so um, I know our like um, player association and our executive committee with that, you know, they were saying um, from the beginning of the year, like, we're only going to be able to, we're only going to go to the bubble if we can like speak out on these things and it's going to be really focused on social justice. And so we made that, um, you know, at the forefront from the beginning, um, you know, before um, games, we had you know, different people up on the big screen telling their story, whether it was Sandra Bland, um, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd, um, you know, telling their story. Um, we had, you know, Black Lives Matters, um, warm ups um, on the court. We had Brianna Taylor's name on our jerseys. So mm -hmm. we really made the point to um, 
you know, get the word out um, about all those things, you know, because one person just watching our game could, that could just spark something in them. Um, and so I think that was super important for us to be able to do that. And like, um, you know, our viewership actually went up this year. And a lot of people were saying that, you know, bringing in social justice is going to like tear down everything, but ours, like it brought everything up, which I think is super cool. Um, and then, yeah, with the reelection um, for Georgia, um, yeah, our owner, our for previous owner now, I guess we can say. Owner, yeah, yep. make sure um, we get that right, yeah. Yep, she, um, she, yeah, was against Black Lives Matter. And I mean, 80% of the WNBA is black. And so like, how can you say that when you have black people on your team? Mm -hmm. And so we just really, you know, took upon ourselves. We had like internal team meetings. We had team, we had meetings with the entire league. Um, we came out with a statement, you know, and then um, we ended up, so it was like Sue Bird and, and Elizabeth Williams who's also on my team. Um, they came up with like the Vote Warnock um, t-shirts that we wore for the ESPN game. Mm -hmm. um, for, I guess that was for two, two days. Yeah, we all wore Vote Warnock shirts. And I mean, that just propelled his, um, his you know, Senate seat. And um, obviously he ended up getting elected, but I think it was just so cool and so powerful to see that, you know, us speaking out on these things where some people, you know, think like no one's listening to the WNBA, blah, blah, blah. But we like really made a change and made a statement. Um, and so I think that was just super powerful to see like how big of a statement we could make, like being united with for each other. It was really cool to see kind of literally the entire league being united hand in hand, like speaking truth to power. It's so cool that you were a part of that. What are some of, you know, if you were to give advice to, you know, other athletes or, you know, anybody else who feel the need to speak up but you know may not have you know that they might not be like the vocal person that you guys all demonstrate yourselves to be but what are some of the other things that I guess you would tell either student athletes or athletes in general like if some injustices are happening around you here's some of the things that you can do to really speak up on it and, and bring attention to that yeah I mean I was kind of that like especially you go in and as a rookie you know you like don't want to like do too much like on the core off the court you know you just kind of want to be like under the radar and so when this was going on you know like I wasn't like speaking up a ton but like I gave my two cents here and there but I think like my team and um just like the league as a whole you know they were really um really vocal and like they like lent that hand out saying like we'll help you like you know say what you want say what you mean um and we're gonna have your back and so I think just I guess something I could say to others would be just to you know have that support system around you and like-minded people um, and, you know, that can take you so many different places. Um, and I think that's really what the league was about. You know, we all stuck together. Um, we were super united and it like changed, you know, so many different things, so many different lives. Um, and so um, I would say, yeah, that's probably the main thing. So you go from the WNBA bubble to your first stint overseas out in Russia. <laughs> Talk to me about obviously the differences in cultures, you know, some of the stuff that you miss from home and, uh, you know, obviously it got cut short, unfortunately, due to injury. We all wish you a speedy recovery. I know you're going through a PT right now, and I know that you're going to be striving to get back on the court as quickly as possible. But just kind of talk to me briefly about, you know, your your quick first experience out uh, playing overseas basketball. Yeah, and that was definitely an um, eye opener. So. I left the bubble and had five days to get prepared to go overseas. I left literally within five days. Um, so it was a quick adjustment. And I actually, like I got to Russia and I walked into my apartment and like I faced my parents. And again, I sound like a freaking wuss, but like I started crying again because I was like, I am so far across the world. And like, it just hadn't hit me until that point. And, I'm right. like, and I had only five days at home, you know? So I'm like, wow, like I'm going to be over here. Like, I don't know when the next time I'm going to be home. Like, I guess it's going to be Christmas, blah, blah, blah. And so it just like it all hit me at that point. But it was such a learning experience, you know, learned some Russian. Um, the style of play is different. Obviously, the food, um, the rubles, you know, the money. <laughs> um, like, literally every single thing. Like, I could walk outside in probably like a five-mile radius and like there could be like three people that speak English. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, thank God for Google Translate is all I'm going to say. <laughs> but yeah, it was just, um, you know, how even just like the cultures over there, like a lot of people, a lot of Americans, like we smile when we pass someone, you know, they don't smile. Um, mm -hmm. Just like even that little thing, like people were looking at me crazy because I would pass them like on the sidewalk and they'd like look at me like, why is she smiling at me? 
and I'm like, do they hate me? Like, <laughs> you're the you're the weird one for smiling, yeah. you know. <laughs> yes, and I'm like, and I'm like mixed girl with like curly hair. They're like, yeah. she's definitely foreign, you know. So, right. um, it was just a huge adjustment. So, um, but I'm super thankful for the learning experience and be to be able to you know have that be my first year overseas. I would say get used to that life because I think that you're going to be in the game for quite some time. Again, hopefully you have a speedy recovery. You're able to get back out there. Uh, do you know as of now what your plans are for this summer? How quickly will you be back to, you know, uh, getting back on the court? And is there a chance that we can see you in a WNBA jersey for this upcoming summer? So it's going to be so six months of the July ish. Um, and that's, you know, pushing it. So um, I don't know if we'll see me in WNBA jersey this year. Um, hoping to just be really prepared for overseas and get some good work in before that. Um, you know, this is, you know, I started doing ball handling and stuff while I can here, um, you know, seated, all that stuff. Now I'm moving a little bit more so I can be standing up. Um, but um, that was probably the biggest adjustment was like not being, you know, part of the game for just like that even just like not having a ball in my hands for like the longest I think I've ever had it not in my hands for the last 18 years. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Um, and so that's probably been the hardest thing. Um, but yeah, I'm just pushing, pushing through actually today in PT, I had, I was able to do a lot more movement stuff. Um, not jumping yet, but I was really close. So we're almost there. I almost start to running. So, um, it's going to be a good process, but I think, um, you know, if I can get through this then it'll be, um, a, a smooth sailing for the next years or so, hopefully. So. Well, I wanted to say thank you so much for stepping into the J with me, Jalen. A great and legend, an absolute stud. Uh, obviously, you know, the whole fan base is rooting for you. Uh, you know how much you've meant to, you know, the Crane fan base in general. So, like I said, today was simply a day just to give you your flowers. You are a first female guest. You're definitely not going to be our last one um like i said yeah speedy recovery can't wait to see you on the court so thank you so much for stepping into the j with me <laughs> yes thank you oh also fun fact i'm gonna this is uh -huh. i had to say this since it's called welcome to the j i yeah. do have to say my class was the last official class yeah. to be able to step foot into the j so I'd just like to yeah couple there <laughs> you already hear folks what, what year was it was it 2017 2018 when um, they shut down? yeah i think it was like 16 17 yeah so had some solid times in there <laughs> it's right yeah it's right here it's not going anyway i i love like when i decide to name it this my inbox flooded with just like oh yeah that's a great name for it shout out to isaiah zierden for pitching that name in the first place too um, for all you guys listening, make sure to like and subscribe to the Phyllis 68 Media Network. And also don't forget to download the locker room at Jalen. Thank you once again, you absolute stud. Good luck. Get healthy. Stay safe out there. And uh, we'll talk to you shortly. Sounds good. Thank you so much.